Our Father, we thank you because of this Bible study tonight. Thank you because we're the family of the children of God. And we know that when we're here, something good always happens unto us. We're studying your word tonight. Father, we pray that the living word will flow freely into our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we are praying that the spirit of the living God, who is the spirit of truth, will encourage our hearts and share with us the truths of the spirit. And by what you teach us from the word of God, we shall be able to know God more, to do exploits, and to live close to the Lord all the days of our lives. Father, we pray that the precious blood of Jesus Christ will cover everything that has been exposed unto God. And as God has forgiven and cleansed, Father, we pray that all those things will remain in God's sea of, forg of forgetfulness. Amen. And everyone will have the liberty to live, to walk, and move in the Spirit. Amen. And there will be no hindrance. But everyone shall be able to live according to the word of God. Amen. Grant us the victory. Amen. Help us to live in victory all the days of our life. Amen. Thank you, Father, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. 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 Continuing with our systematic study of the Bible, and today we're going to examine verses in chapter 4 of Genesis and chapter 5 of Genesis. This weekend we had a wonderful time with the Lord. It was such a great revelation as the Lord brought ministers of the word who came to minister the word unto us. Last Monday we studied about the fall of man, the havoc, the harm, the evil, the suffering that the devil brought into our lives. But this weekend the Lord has been feeding us and teaching us that we do not need to live under the suffering and under the curse of um, the fall. We don't have to live under subjection to the devil. We don't have to live under the overpowering influence of sin and of Satan and of sickness. But that Jesus Christ has brought our victory to us. On uh, Friday we learnt about victory. And uh, from Saturday morning until the evening we were here, thousands of us, if you were not here, well, maybe it wasn't your fault, you didn't hear about it. Or if you heard, you didn't know, it will be like that. If um, people have talked to you, uh, you would have known it was a great revelation we received. Um, that Saturday morning we received a powerful message on pulling down the strongholds, the strongholds of the enemy. And then just immediately after that, there was a very simple but deep message on the ABC of faith. And then um, immediately after that, I had to know what to do when nothing seems to work. And that thing changed our prayer life. And the evening, uh, our minister came here. I was watching him. He was transformed into another man. As he brought the message so powerful and dynamic on how to minister life, how to receive life and minister that life. And you could, if you were here that night, uh, you saw people uh, jumping and clapping. I mean actually clapping. Not the type of clapping you clap when you are forced to clap. Spontaneously, with the Spirit of God, the life of God surging up in our hearts. People clapped and they were so happy, they went home rejoicing. We came back Sunday morning, and uh, that morning, you needed to be here that morning. It was like you had never been in this ministry before, as the brother brought a message, you can change your destiny. In fact, if I were to, if you tell me to repeat all he said, I can spend 30 minutes here talking about Jabez, how that man changed his name and his destiny from sorrow unto happiness. And we were taught that day on how to change our destiny. And uh, after that, a minister came in here and just challenged us with how to demonstrate Satan's defeat. 
Did you ever realize you could demonstrate Satan's defeat? Well, that's what we learned on Sunday. Just yesterday, and it is still fresh in our mind. And um, in the afternoon, a minister walked in here, and I, I wonder what the minister was going to say. And the minister said, did you see me as I walk up here? Everybody we said, yes, we saw you. Then the minister told us, I was walking on the devil's said when I was coming. My, that was something. Isn't that something? And then last night, last night we were told seven principles, seven principles of how to keep what God has given. And those seven principles are inside me. You saw me here last night as I came and I repeated all the seven principles. I wasn't looking at my book when I was repeating them. I just, when the minister taught us, I was repeating them. Repeated them to myself. I memorized them right in my head. And I came in here, closed my Bible, closed my books, and I just repeated before everybody. They said, ah, this brother, did he know that thing before? Or was it him that gave the seven principles to the brother? Oh, no, I didn't give him. But when he just said them and challenged me, I said, that is something. And I wanted to learn them. So immediately I learned them and I was able to rehearse them to you. You don't have those dynamic messages and you don't know how to have the victory and keep the victory. Well, our cassette ministry, they are doing fine. They are doing a good job this year. And uh, you need any of those messages, just uh, get in contact with the tape ministry. And they will tell you how to have victory and maintain victory for 1982. But this evening, I'm talking about Cain, Abel, and the patriarchs. And I'm reading in Genesis chapter 4, verses 1. Uh, to the end, I'll be skipping some verses. And then in chapter 5, I will see some verses as well. Genesis chapter 4. From verse 1. And Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived, and bare came, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his suffering. But unto Cain and to his suffering he had not respect and Cain was very wroth and his countenance fell and the Lord said unto Cain why art thou wroth and why is thy countenance falling if thou doest well shalt thou not be accepted and if thou doest not well sin lies at the door and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel his brother. And it came to pass, when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood cries unto me from the ground. And now art thou cursed from the earth, which has opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand when thou tillest the ground? It shall not henceforth yield unto thee a strength, a fugitive, and a vagabond shall thou be in the earth. And Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from the face from thy face shall I be hid. 
and I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth, and it shall come to pass that every one that findeth me shall slay me. And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod, on the east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived, and bare Enoch, and he builded a city, and called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. And unto Enoch was born Irad. And Irad begat Mehujael, and Mehujael begat Mehu Methusael, and Methusael begat Lamech, and Lamech took unto him two wives. The name of one was Ada, and the name of the other Zillah, and Ada bare Ada bear Jabel. He was the father of such as dwell in tents and of such as have cattle. And his brother's name was Juba. He was the father of all such as Sandal, the harp, and organ, and Zilla. She also bare Tuba came, an instructor of every artificer in brass and iron, and the sister of Tuba came, Niyama. And Lamech said unto his wives, Ada and Zila, Hear my voice, ye wives of Lamech, hearken unto my speech, for I have slain a man to my wounding, and a young man to my heart. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech seventy and sevenfold. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son. And called his name, says, For God said she has appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. And to say to him also, There was born a son, and he called his name Enos. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. Chapter 5, This is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made he him. Male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam. In the day when they were created, and Adam lived an hundred and thirty years and begat his son in his own likeness after his image and called his name Seth. And the days of Adam, after he had begotten Seth, were eight hundred years. And he begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Adam, that Adam lived, were nine hundred and thirty years. And he died. And Seth lived an hundred and five years and begat Enos. And Seth lived after he begat Enos eight hundred and seven years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enos of uh, Seth were nine hundred and twelve years and he died. Verse 11. All the days of Enos were 905 years, and he died. Then, verse 14, all the days of Canaan were 910 years, and he died. Verse 17, and all the days of Mahalaleel were 890 and 5 years, and he died. Verse 20, and all the days of Jared were 960 and two years, and he died. 21, and Enoch lived 60 and five years, 
and begat Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 360 and five years. And Enoch walked with God. And he was not, for God took him. And Methuselah lived an hundred eighty and seven years and begat Lamech. Twenty seven. And all the days of Methuselah were nine hundred sixty and nine years, and he died. Verse thirty one. And all the days of Lamech were seven hundred seventy. And seven years, and he died. I read the most part of chapter 4 and chapter 5. In many respects, and for many reasons, these two chapters are very important. Many theologians have problems with the records we have in these two chapters. There are some people who say that these names that were written here were just suggested. They were not real. And they were not part of history, they will say. You see, already tonight, as I read those scriptures, I have mentioned a number of names. Some of them were told they lived, they died. Their history was so short, even though their lives were so long. They lived for hundreds of years, but there is not a sentence about what they did. They lived to no purpose. Their life could not be written down in God's own record. They had a name that they lived, but alas, eventually they died. Hundreds of years they lived. And nobody could point at this is the good they did. This is what they did that God will reward them for. And it will be good you don't live like that. If already you have lived 30 years or 40 years or 50 years, you ought to be asking yourself by now, what have I done? That can go into record with God as good as righteous, as great, as important that will be rewarded in eternity. A priest met me who had studied for a long, long time. And um, he saw me and he said, I see you are a Bible teacher. I said, yes, I am, by the grace of God. He said, do you believe Genesis? I said, yes, I do. He said, everything, I said, everything from chapter 1 to the end of it, and then the whole Bible. Oh, then he said, well, but I've studied. I said, is that so? He said, yes. And that he has discovered that uh, all, those, uh, all those names, uh, they just put them there. They are not right. I said, how do you know? He said, well, you see, it cannot be true. And this priest was, uh, is a Catholic. And I know that they say that these chapters are prehistoric. I said, well, I believe them. And I'll soon tell you reasons why I believe these things. You'll see them right in the word of God. But uh, then I called him. I said, do you believe that Mary 
was a virgin you know the catholics they believe that very seriously oh he said yes mary was a virgin do you believe that nobody met mary and mary just gave birth to jesus he said yes i believe i said well, how can you believe that you educated person and you have studied very much that Mary did not meet any man and yet a virgin conceived and bore a son and his name was called Jesus he said I take it by faith <laughs> I said you struck the point in the same way I am taking Genesis by faith <laughs> and he had no answer after that but let me show you that Jesus Christ, the Lord himself, he believed all these. The New Testament writers who are nearer home than those Old Testament people nearer to us, they believed all these and they mentioned them. If you remember what I have read in Genesis chapter 5, let me go through Genesis chapter 5 with you again and show you some names. Verse 1, Adam. Verse 3, the name there, Seth. Verse 6, the name there, Enos. Verse 12, there is the name there, Canaan. Verse um, 15, there is the name Mahalaleel. Verse 18, there is a name there, Jared. And in verse 21, we have Methuselah. There is a name Methuselah there in verse um, 21. And in verse 28, we have Lamech. And then in verse 30, we have the name Noah. Now you turn with me to the pages of the New Testament in Luke chapter 3. And let us see whether these names actually existed. Luke chapter 3, from verse 23. And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being, as was supposed, the son of Joseph, which was the son of Eli, which was the son of Mathat, which was the son of Levi, and so on. Now, as you go through down, this, uh, through down the list, and you see which was the son of, which was the son of, which was the son of, then you come to verse 36, which was the son of Canaan, which was the son of Aphaxad, which was the son of Shame, which was the son of Noah, which was the son of Lamech, that's the name we met in Genesis chapter 5 which was the son of Methuselah, that's the name we met in Genesis chapter 5, which was the son of Enoch, which was the son of Jared, which was the son of Ma Malaliel, which was the son of Canaan, which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. <laughs> you see, the Lord has a reason for writing all that in Genesis chapter 5. He knew that doubters and scoffers and scorners and unbelievers will arise. And he has preserved that in Genesis chapter 5. My brother, sister, all those things written in Genesis, they are true. Every judge, every letter, and every sentence. How about Abel? How about Cain? Was there anybody that was called Abel? Was there anybody that was called Cain? Was it actually true that Cain killed Abel? Matthew chapter 23. Verse 35. Here is our Lord, Jesus Christ, who says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. Who cannot lie? Who knew the truth? Because he was the embodiment of the truth himself. He is the word, and that word became flesh. And he never told a lie. He told us in chapter 23 of Matthew verse 35. That upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth. Righteous blood shed upon the earth. 
from the blood of righteous Abel. Jesus cannot make a mistake about that. Jesus talked about the blood of Abel unto the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berachias, whom he slew between the temple and the altar. How about Cain? Was it true that Cain actually lived? Or are they just giving us these names just to make up a story? First John, chapter 3, the first epistle of John, chapter 3, 12. Not as Cain, not as Cain, who was of the wicked one, and slew his brother. Wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil, and his brothers righteous. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4. Hebrews 11, verse 4. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. That verse is telling us, Cain offered a sacrifice to God, not acceptable. Abel also offered a sacrifice unto God, which was acceptable. So, actually, those two people existed. And uh, from these New Testament records, it is very clear that these people we have read about actually existed. Then we have read about Enoch. How about this Enoch? Did he actually exist in Jude? Jude, having only one chapter, we read in verse 14. Jude, chapter 1, having just one chapter. Then reading in verse 14. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam. Enoch also, the seventh from Adam. If you count those people, Adam, Seth, Enos, Canaan, Mahalaliel, Jared, and Enoch. You'll discover those are seven names. And Enoch was the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints. You know, Enoch walked with God. And the secret of the Lord is with them that fear him. And the secret was, was with Enoch that the Lord will come with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all. And to convince all that are ungodly among them of all the ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. So rest assured, what we're reading about in Genesis chapters 4 and 5 are actually true, true to the letter. Now let us go back to that account in Genesis. We read in chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. This is the book of the generations of Adam in the day that God created man. In the likeness of God made he him. Here we are told there was a day God created Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve had not been from eternity. And they were not their own makers. God made them. And because they were not their own makers, they must not be their own masters. He who made us must be our master, our Lord. He who created us, the creator, must be our king and our Lord. Male and female created he them and blessed them. Today, fathers bless their children. And you see that Adam was referred to as the son of God, which was the son of God, we've read in Luke. And 
God the Creator, their direct Father, by creation blessed them. And what was the blessing? That they should multiply. And he called their name, their name, the name of both Adam and Eve, called Adam. That means Mr. and Mrs. Adam. That's why we got it. That's why when a person marries, uh, the lady or the woman is called by the husband's name. He called their name, Adam, in the day when they were created. And then in Genesis chapter 3, verse 20, in fulfillment to the promise that God had made that they shall multiply, replenish the earth, or fill up the earth, then uh, we are told that Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Some people ask the question, where did Cain get his wife? Remember, Eve was the mother of all living. Some people also ask the question, when Cain said, uh, you are driven me out from your side. If men see me, they will kill me. Who are these people who will see Cain and kill Cain? Eve was the mother of all living. Realize this, please, that when Adam and Eve were created, they were not created as babies. They were created as fully grown men. In the very day that Adam was created, he was already talking, already having fellowship with God. And God brought all the animals. The very first day Adam was created, when he had not spent even a week, when he was not a month old in the world, God brought all the animals and he named everyone, one by one. Well, you have already spent 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. And right now, if uh, all the birds in Lagos were brought, and they say, what's the name of this one? You don't know uh, the sparrow from another type of bird? You know the eagle and you know the chicken. After those two, which else do, do you know? Now, but Adam, on that very first day, he was able to name everything. And then when the woman was made, and was brought to Adam, immediately Adam could talk and said, this is bone of my bone, recognized immediately. Well, you've been searching to know the will of God and you have not been able to know after you become a Christian for how many years? But Adam knew all that immediately. He was created fully grown and immediately they started having children. And by the time he was 130 years of age, they had had children and children and children. By the time he became more than 900 years, the Bible just says they had sons and daughters. They didn't give us the names of all the people because we don't need all their names. If you go to the records in the government, you'll not find all the names of people here tonight there in the book of people in the government. Why? Well, if they are going to write all the names down, one by one, well, they'll not be able to do any other thing. They just write the names of a few people who are important to carry out some work that are to be done. So that is why all their names are not preserved down. Adam and Eve were created by God. And as I've told you now, all human beings after them were born, not created, as Adam and Eve. The accounts in Genesis uh, chapters 1 to 5 are not following sequentially. There are repetitions because God wanted those repetitions in, those, in that way. Those who ask uh, foolish questions should just remember that at that time, they were not there. And you look at uh, what people do, how people are. If anybody is talking to me now, and I said, um, in 1966, there was a change of government uh, in Nigeria, there was, a, there was a coup, and this happened, and this happened, and I started telling him names of the people in the political regime at that time. 
And then when the army took over, I started telling him some names of people uh, who were significant in the coup at that time. When I finish, he'll not say, I don't believe. He will believe everything I say. But he wasn't there at that time. How many of you have been to America before? How many of you have not been in America before? You have not been in America. Raise up your hand. Well, does America exist? Yes. How do you know? <laughs> you believe. Some people have been there and they came to tell us there is America. All right, I accept. And there are people we read about, uh, about in history. How many of you believe that uh, there, is a, there was a person in this world before called Martin Luther? Let me see your hand. Martin Luther. So you actually believe that Martin Luther existed before? Yes. Actually? Yes. Did you see him? No. no. We take all these things by faith. It is true that they actually existed. And when we read their books, when you go to the bookshop and then you pick up a book and they say, written by so and so, you just tell everybody, I'm holding a book now, written by so and so. How are you sure that he actually wrote it? You accept by faith. Because actually they are true. And in the same way these things we're reading about, they are even more sure and they are more true than all the facts of history that we have all around us. I've told you about this patriarch who lived and died. And uh, if Jesus tarries, many of us who are alive now, eventually you will leave this world. Remember that always, please. You will not always be in the world. Look at people who lived for 969 years, 930 years, 912 years. They laid and laid and laid. But one day, 900 years finished. And today people don't live as long. And one day, 70 years will finish. 80 years will finish. 93 years will finish. What will be the record about your life at that time? Will it be recorded? He lived. Then he died. Didn't do good to anybody. Was so selfish. Didn't serve God. Was so wicked. But we thank God because he is dead. A troublesome fellow. He is gone. Is that what they will say about you? When you die, will people just weep in as a matter of routine? They were, if we don't weep, they will say maybe we don't feel him. But actually, he is good. He has gone. When he was here, what good did he do? He ate all his food alone. He lived in isolation. He was no blessing to anybody. You saw him, you saw terror. He never helped anybody. So stingy. And that man can gossip. He can break anybody's house. He was very wicked. But, uh, well, they said he has died. And when such people die, women will be coming from their houses. While they are coming, they will be talking. They will be saying, that old fellow is gone. When he was in the world, he lived as if, uh, as if he will never die. They will be talking that on the way. They will say, uh, God is great. <laughs> Nobody will live forever here. That time, if you asked him for a particular help, he'll never do it. And uh, the pastor will be discussing with another person. Say, Tell him to come to church, he will never come. Tell him to come to Bible study, he will never come. He felt he will never live there. Now he has died. They will be discussing that when they are coming to see those who are bereaved. But when they get to the front of your house, they change their countenance. <laughs> then they become serious. Then uh, they, they knock at the door gently. They say, I hear that our papa has gone and has died. And they begin to cry, professional crying. <laughs> because actually they don't mean it. Actually they are happy eventually that man has died. It was troublesome to everybody. And your wife, who had been asking before, well, 
uh, this fellow is just that we can't kill him. Eventually, when you die, because of the mother-in-law and the father-in-law will look very serious, they tell her to mourn for seven days and, and she will mourn inside that she will be saying, anyway, I'll soon be out of this place. <laughs> because actually you didn't mean anything to the people you are living with when you were on earth. But when a good man dies, a righteous man, a helpful person, a worthy person, a child of God, everybody will feel his presence. They'll say, that brother can pray. You are in any trouble and you meet that fellow, he knows how to encourage a person. Why do righteous people die? Quickly. Then these, these wicked fellows who should die that keep on living. That's what people say. When a righteous man dies, you know it all over the town. Everybody will be coming. Look at what they did for me. 19 so and so. I didn't get any work. Before I got work, it was that brother so and so that was maintaining me. If it's in a Christian ministry, when such a person dies, we'll be saying, how can we fill his place? How can we replace him? Because that brother, tell him to do anything. He can sing. He can preach. He can sweep the ground. He can comfort those who are bereaved. He can pray for the sick. He can preach on the crusade. He can teach in a retreat. What can't he do? We have missed that brother. And if it were not that we believe that they have gone to be with the Lord, our sorrow will just continue. When good people die, everybody mourns. But how will you all be? Look at these people. They lived, they died, they lived, they died, they lived, they died. Job. Chapter 30, verse 23. For I know that thou wilt bring me to death and to the house appointed for all living. That's it, the grave appointed to all living. In Psalm 49, verse 10. Psalm 49, reading in verse 10. For he sees that wise men die. Men who have taken exams and passed exams. Men with certificates. Men with money. Men wise in business. Men wise to rule over other people. Wise men die. Likewise the fool, who could not make two ends meet, they also die, and the brutish person perish, and leave their wealth to others, leave their wealth to others. Let's be mindful how we accumulate things on earth, because eventually those things will be left to others. Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 8. Ecclesiastes chapter 8 verse 8 There is no man that has power over the spirit to retain the spirit neither has he power in the day of death and there is no discharge in that um, in that war neither shall wickedness deliver those that are given to it and when people die, they are not forgotten. Something happens. When people die, in Hebrews chapter 9, these are verses that everybody ought to know. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, judgment. What does that mean? After this, judgment. Does it mean that the person will be given some strokes of the cane? No. Does it mean that the person will be told um, to carry some heavy load for two days, three days, and one week, and that is the end of it? No. Look at what that means. It says, it is appointed unto man wants to die after that after the death 
judgment. What does that mean? Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. Reading from verse 19. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and feared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate, full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores, and it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also, and the rich man also, will rich men die? Yes. Will those who have gone to study abroad, will they die one day? Yes. Uh -uh. The rich man also died and was buried. Next time when you felt, when you feel too big to be corrected. When you feel too great above your fellow man. When you feel that you are the all in all. When you feel that your house is so good and you are going to live in that house for a long time. Remember, the rich man also died and was buried. Once death, after this judgment and in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments. These days they keep them in mortuary for one month. And they send all over the country, publishing the paper, so and so, great man, educated in the primary school of this place, secondary school that place, when it was cast to be educated. Then went abroad, 19 such and such, then came back and established the largest establishment that was ever possible in Nigeria. He had 10 wives and he sustained by 60 children and has grandchildren. And then this company will write in the papers in memory of that person. Great man. The universities will write in the memory of that person great man. He had many doctorate degrees. He was just getting them and earning them. He was actually a great man. They put him in mortuary and they are making noise here. Then they are asking for those who will come and beat drum. They sent to overseas to get a particular, a, some particular drummers. They block the roads. You cannot pass. They get police and they get police paper. And then police are standing. People come, they drink, they dance, they rejoice. And then they say, on Sunday, meet us in the church. He's going to have a decent burial. And there are some, then the preacher will preach and say, uh-huh, you see that it's good for this person now. One month after the person has died. Look at how many people are. If you want to be buried like this, come to this church. And that person was not born again. Did not give his life to Jesus Christ when he was on earth. He lived in sin. Met other people's uh, wives. And nobody could arrest him because he had the money. He could destroy anybody's house without anybody questioning him. Now he is dead. Everybody is dancing. Papa has gone home. True, he went home. Because I say home for sinners. And I say home for believers. Went home. And after one month that the fellow had been in hellfire, burning, the pastor will be praying here. May his soul rest in peace. The prayer is too late. As it is appointed unto men once to die. After this judgment, verse 23, in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torment, and sees Abraham afar off. And Lazarus in his bosom. Lazarus, poor man, take heart. Just receive Jesus into your heart. 
He that loves last, loves best. And he cried. Rich men will cry. They'll cry. They'll cry. And said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. He became a beggar. The beggar on earth became rich in heaven. Rich with joy, with happiness, with, with supply, with surplus. He was resting in Abraham's bosom. But the rich man on earth became, became a beggar in hell fire. And what was he begging for? Drop of water. Drop of water. Send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, touch my tongue. Eh? They won't allow us to touch their clothes here. You sit by some of these people in the bus and they look at you like this as if you are a dog. They won't even let their mother touch them. No, they're too clean. They're too rich. A dog will be in front of their house and as you are coming, the dog will be chasing you back. They are protected. They are living in a palace of their own. And a poor fellow can't come around. And in the church too, oh, they have special seats. And you dare not go and sit there when they are, when they are going to sit down. They will know, they will say, who is that? Don't you know that in this church, I bought that seat? All right, you bought that seat. A time is coming when all that money will fail. All that popularity and fame will get into fire, will be burnt completely. Certificates. A time is coming when you will not remember certificates. When you will be carried out, carried out of the building, and just be dumped inside the ground closed up and then your wife and your friends and all the people they will run back home rush back home and be fighting for the money at that time what will be your comfort at that time here in verse 24 and cool my tongue for i am tormented i am tormented in this flame but abraham said son remember that thou in thy, life, in thy lifetime receivest thy good things. Likewise, uh, Lazarus, evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. Besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Torment. Now we go back to Genesis in chapter 4. We'll briefly look at these two people, Abel and Cain. Verse 3. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. Well, Cain acknowledged that there was God. So his problem was not the problem of the atheist. He actually believed there is God. His problem was not the problem of the agnostic that says, I don't know. I don't think there's anything I want to do about whether God exists or not. No, Cain knew. And he knew something must be done. Cain also knew that he was a sinner. And he knew that sacrifice must be made before he could be free from his sins. The Bible has told us, in sin did my mother conceive me, I was shapen in iniquity. The Bible says, can anyone bring a clean sin out of an unclean? No, not one. And the Bible declares that all men died in Adam. That's Romans 5.12. So Cain understood that he was a sinner. A sinner by birth. A sinner by choice. A sinner by nature. A sinner by practice. And therefore think about it any way you want. He was a sinner. The sin principle was inside him. But not only that, his life showed that he was a sinner. 
and he knew that he needed to make contact with this holy God. He needed a sacrifice. But then, what type of sacrifice did he bring? The work of his hand. The work of his hand. But he forgot that the ground had been cursed. And he brought fruit out of the cursed ground to beg God to say, I am sorry. And the Lord did not accept that. That is why our composers in songs have written it down. Could my tears forever flow? Could my zeal no respite know? All these for sin cannot atone. Thou and thou alone must say. It says, what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. But the pity is, people sing that Sunday morning. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Then they also go to sing other songs related to that, that the works of their hands cannot save them. Then they come out of that church service. Then they gave money to the beggars. Now you talk to them about confessing their sins, repenting of their sins, and believing on the Lord Jesus Christ who will take their sins away. Oh, they say, well, already I am good. I give money to the beggar. I don't do any evil to anybody. My heart is just like this. And check up his heart. It's a wicked heart. And he knows. He can tell lie more than even the devil. But he will say, my heart is like this. He sings. And he knows that he is wicked at heart, but he will say, well, I am good. Just because we don't know him, but his wife knows him. Her husband knows her. Her children know her. And he knows himself to be a sinner. Without being cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ, the best man on earth is a sinner. Terrible sinner. But he came and brought the fruit of his own hand. And he was rejected. Look at Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6. This one tells us the whole story about Cain and about those who are pretending today to be pleasing God or serving God when they are not believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Isaiah 64, verse 6. But we are all as an unclean thing. We all, we all, as an unclean thing. And all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And we all do fade as a leaf. And our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags in Titus chapter 3 we are told we cannot be saved by the works of our own hand some people say it's because the yam he brought was not very big no no could my tears forever flow could my zeal no respite no all these for sin cannot atone. Rock of ages cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the blood and the water from the riven side which flowed be of sin the double kill, cleansing me from the guilt and the power of sin. When my eyes close in death, when I'm no more in this world, only one thing will matter. Rock of ages cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. It is not because the yams were small or the fruit of the ground uh, was small, but because that it was the fruit from the cursed ground, bloodless sacrifice. And in Titus chapter 3, verse 4 and verse 5, But after the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, 
not by works of righteousness. Not by works of righteousness. I am good. I help people. I am open-hearted. I am um, very good to people. And I help as many as I can find in my place of work. Everybody calls me daddy because they know that I am a person who will give them money anytime. You cannot be saved through that. I have never smoked. I have never drunk. I don't go to meet other people's uh, wives. You cannot be saved by that. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done. But according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. That was the problem of Cain. And the Lord talked to him about it. When he was wrath, the Lord said, why are you wrath? If you have done well, you will be accepted. I am not a partial God. God is no respecter of persons. He was telling him, he was preaching the gospel to him, saying, if you have done well, you will be accepted. That's the same gospel that says that in all nations, they that walk righteousness are accepted unto him. That's the same gospel that says God is no respecter of persons, but if you have not done well, sin lies at the door. The sin offering lies at the door, crouches at the door. Go and take it and sacrifice it. That's the gospel being told him that it is not too late yet. You have seen your brother. His sacrifice is accepted. You do the same. You have heard how the Israelites were saved when they applied the blood of the Lamb upon their houses. You do the same. You have heard. How Jesus said, this is the blood of the new covenant, the new testament, shed for the sins of many. Apply that same blood. You have heard when the apostle Paul said in Acts 20, 28, saying, take it unto yourself and to the church that is purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. Apply that same blood. And Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22 says, almost all sins were by the blood purged. For without the shedding of blood is no remission of sins. Therefore you have known the blood is still flowing. The blood of Jesus is still available. Apply the blood and be cleansed. Haven't you read in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7? As we were redeemed. Redeemed. He has given us redemption through his blood. Even the forgiveness of our sins. It is the blood. And in 1 John chapter Chapter 1 verse 7, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of his son, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son cleanses us from all unrighteousness. So God was preaching the gospel to Cain, saying, if you have not done well, and you know that that is why you have not been accepted, you can still pray. You can still seek my face. You can still come with the sacrifice of the blood of the Lamb. But no, Cain will not accept. He envied Abel. He looked at Abel. He discussed with him. And he killed him. Like today, those whose religions has not saved them, they persecute us who have been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. They look at us and see the blessing of salvation. And they say, so you think you are going to show us the way? You are just a little child. Yes, Abel was younger than Cain. But he knew the way, the way of salvation. You are just a little child. We have been serving God before you were born. Well, but your sins have not been forgiven. Your sacrifice has not been accepted. And because of that, they will persecute the young ones who have received favor from the Lord. So he discussed with him and killed him. What did Abel do? Let us see in chapter 4, verse 4. And Abel, he also brought also of the firstlings of his flock and the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4, that passage we read in Genesis is interpreted well unto us. That when Abel offered sacrifice, there was something within him, and that was faith. 
He believed God. He was saying, Father, I know I am a sinner. My father sinned. My mother sinned. In sin was I born. In iniquity I was shapen. No, I cannot plead that I am righteous. I am a sinner. And I am believing you. I am forsaking all the works of my own righteousness. Oh no, I am not good. But I'm seeking your face. I want you to forgive me. I want you to remove all my sins. And I'm believing that I am sacrificing this. As I'm sacrificing this, shedding innocent blood. Because the life is in the blood. And the blood has God given for the atonement, for the covering and the cleansing of our sins. Abel was saying that. And we're told in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4. By faith, Abel offered. He didn't just come ordinarily like people come. Go into the church. And they don't do anything by faith. Just close their eyes. Sing without faith. Pray without faith. Tell God to help them this week without faith. They don't know about the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross of Calvary. That's why many of them are still killing rams. In December they'll kill rams. April they'll kill rams. Every time they'll kill rams. But it's not like that. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. He was not righteous before the sacrifice. He became righteous after that sacrifice. It is when you take the blood of Jesus Christ to cleanse you that you become righteous. God testifying of his gifts and by it he being dead yet speaketh. Genesis chapter 5. From verse 21, it wasn't only Abel that came to know God, that sought God in the right way, that followed the plan of redemption, that became forgiven and redeemed. We're told of Enoch here, verse 22, and Enoch walked with God. After he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. Verse 24 And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Five things about Enoch Enoch lived when there was not much encouragement to godly living. All people around him were corrupt, sinful, evil. But Enoch at the age of 65 decided, I will accept the remedy for sin. I will follow God. I will no more follow my wayward, uh, my wayward paths. I will live right. He turned away from sin and turned unto God. He repented of his sins and had relationship and fellowship with God. And for 300 years, he didn't backslide. Enoch was different from the person who will get saved on Sunday and lose it on Monday. Get saved on Monday at the Bible study and by next Monday when he comes back, he's asking for salvation again. No, Enoch lived when there was not much encouragement to godly living. All around him was bad but he was good. Like the white lily that grows out of the soil, out of the dirty soil, but remains wild. Enoch walked with God like no other man around him. You may be going to a fellowship or church service or denomination where you don't believe sanctification. That doesn't hinder you. You may be going to a place where they don't believe that you can live above sin. Enoch lived above sin. When all people around him did not believe you could live above sin. And Enoch, though a family man, wholeheartedly trusted God and had great faith. Some people say, uh, when you are married, you cannot live right. The children will disturb you. They won't allow you to pray. They won't allow you to read your Bible. Your wife will be a serious disturbance to you. But no, Enoch was married. And even had children, sons and daughters. Yet, he walked with God. It is not marriage that dissolves you from living above sin. It is unbelief. It is unwillingness to live for God. 
It is lack of respect for God and for the word of God. It is not marriage that is disturbing you. It is not your wife. It is not your husband. It is not your children. It is unwillingness to live right. When you actually love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength, it doesn't matter how dirty your surrounding may be. In that surrounding, as a family man or family woman, you can live a righteous life before God. Enoch maintained a consistent daily faith work with God 300 years. And the last thing we hear about this man is that God said, you are too good to die. Don't die. He was walking with God. And the wife will be saying, oh, please, I don't have time for all that. Oh. Every Monday, Bible study, Bible study. You are an old man. You are going to all those young, young people, going to study Bible. Don't, don't bother me with all this religion. Leave me alone. Let me enjoy my life. But one day, while they were just jesting like that, Enoch, Enoch did not mind them. When you mean business with God, you don't mind all these other people. You know where you are going. But Enoch, Enoch just walked with God, walked with God, walked with God, and they didn't find him anymore. The flood was coming, and God said, no, Enoch, you won't see the flood. You won't see the flood. All your surrounding, they are too, it's too dirty for you. You are fit for heaven. Now. Let's go home. And one of these days, like Enoch was translated. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We'll not be here for a long time. All these people in the offices who are saying, uh, that lady, too religious. We'll be making fun and say, eh, Sister Mary, come home. There is a religious question. Uh, one day they won't find you to ask you that question. Your mother persecuting you, your father persecuting you, or your relatives persecuting you. And they're saying, too religious. Too religious. And we'll read the Bible and read the Bible as if she's the only one who loves God. Well, wait and see. Wait and see. First Thessalonians chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 13. But I would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not after as, um, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For we say unto you by the word of the Lord that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend. Like God came down to pick Enoch away, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. With the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we. Everybody say we. we. Pray you the one of them. Amen. You know that day, it will be very good if it happens immediately after Bible study, after we have prayed. But let me tell you, it may not happen that way. Maybe when you are just in your office, and they are pulling your leg, and they are teasing you. And somebody says, you abused me back. You see, he knows he has nothing to lose. He's a child of hell. But if you abuse him back, you have something to lose. All these people who want you to commit sin, they have nothing to lose. They're already down. And they can't fall lower than the ground. But you have something to lose. Because you're seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. And they want to pull you down. Let's be careful. Because it may be just at that time, just at that time, just at that time, that the trumpet will sound. And we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Maybe now. Maybe at night. Maybe anywhere. But a day is coming. When all the papers in this nation will carry it on the headline. When it, it will appear on the news, in the television, and over the radio, and they will say, people are gone. God just took them home. Where did they go? And the mother will be looking for the child. All the little babies that are born, they are gone. Because there is no sin accountable to them yet. That they have committed themselves. And all the believers, if a driver is a believer, he's gone. And all the others are left. And we'll gather. 
from all the four corners of the earth, from America, from England, from Africa, from Asia, from Australia. We just gather, we just go over in the air, just go to be with the Lord. And I tell you, when we, the salt of the earth, when we have left this world, it will be terrible. Let's rise up and pray.